good morning, Word of God. Are you blessed to be in the assembly today? Well, let's stand together if we would. I want to open to 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. I want to read a few verses here and then we'll pray and, and you can be seated. It's been two powerful services here this morning. Welcome to round three. I know you came because you thought 1130 would be the one that you get the most out of. So let's see what the Lord's going to do. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter number 10, as we pick up this morning in part three, part three of pulling down strongholds. Today, we're going to talk a lot about the changing of mind and we'll, we'll dig into Ephesians six where the Bible speaks of the helmet of salvation, part three this morning. Second Corinthians chapter number 10, when you arrive there, just say amen. We'll start in verse number three. <clears throat> For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. We need to remind ourselves of this often because it's easy to get caught up in the flesh and thinking that folk are the problem when the issue is you, right? For the weapons of our warfare, not carnal, that word carnal again just means fleshy. The weapons of our warfare, not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Notice that statement there, to the pulling down of strongholds. And what does that look like? Verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought. So we're dealing here with our images and our imaginations and our thoughts bringing them into the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. In light of what we've read, let's pray, okay? Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit. And I pray right now, Father, for all who would be under the sound of my voice at this very moment. For those assembled here in Shreveport and Bossier, for those watching this live stream or telecast, I ask that you would bless our hearing and that by your Holy Spirit, we would receive revelation knowledge, that you would give us wisdom and spiritual understanding. We ask you for a conviction of truth, words of hope, faith, and salvation. And I ask now, Father, sincerely that you would speak through me words that you would have spoken, that you would override the previous two services and my studied and premeditated thoughts. May your spirit speak by me in this moment words that you would have me to speak. I ask that you would make my tongue the pen of a ready writer that I could write on the hearts and minds of these, your people, your anointed word that removes our burdens and destroys our yokes forever. As we boldly declare that Satan is defeated, we are redeemed, and Jesus is Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, greet two or three people around you. Make them feel welcome this morning before you take your seat. Now just tell somebody close by, let's get into it. We want to welcome our Bossier campus that's watching in real time. This was not a pre-recorded message. It's really happening right now. Can we give Bossier a shout out? Amen. We love you guys. I was in California and I visited my wife and family. Now we visited a satellite church that was off the main campus. And when I got there, the message was pre-recorded from the previous night. And I just want our Bozier campus to know I didn't get up here last night and pre-record no message. You hear what I'm saying to you? This is happening right now. I also want to welcome those that are watching our live stream. We got folk literally all over the world that are watching. I want to welcome those in North Carolina, all over the state of Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Poland. Come on, somebody. Cape Town, South Africa. Praise the Lord. Uh, down in Cushada. Thought I'd pull that next to being on the other side of the world, South Carolina, uh, uh, Virginia, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, Arkansas, Illinois, Indiana, 
uh, Georgia, Bahrain in the Middle East, and Nigeria. Can we give all those places a shout out this morning? Man, praise the Lord. We're blessed to be wherever you are today. We read before the prayer in 2 Corinthians chapter number 10. Let's go back and, and revisit a couple of those verses, and then we're going to go uh, to Ephesians 6. So keep your Bibles open. Notice here in verse 3, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 tells us that man is a spirit. God made us to be a spirit. We live in a body of flesh, and we possess a will, a soul, a mind, an intellect. So man is triune in nature. Understanding that helps us understand peace. Because in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, the Bible talks about peace being wholeness. And I can't be whole when my body's healthy, but my mind is messed up. So the, 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 the wholeness affects my complete man, spirit, soul, and body. And Romans chapter 7, as we studied last week, makes this case of this battle that goes on within between our spirit and the conviction of who we are and the temptation that is in our flesh and how our control panel, our mind gets torn in between. Anybody here ever been double-minded about something? All right, my hand's up in the air. And so even before Christ, think about this, even before Christ, before we were saved, accepted Christ, even before then, we would say things like, something told me. I had a hunch, right? Why? Because the Word tells us that the spirit of man the core of man, the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord that gives us direction. So even before salvation, the Lord communes with us in an ear that's within. It's an inner ear. And we all, I feel like, it's at, at the any age of maturity, know that battle of there's a conviction inside of me, but there's a temptation outside of me. There's the desire to do the right thing in me, but this chocolate cake at midnight is screaming my name. You hear what I'm saying to you? So that's a real war, and we're not just making stuff up. You don't need to be real spiritual. I've been raised in church to recognize that the mind gets caught in the middle of the dilemma of the temptation of the flesh and the conviction that's in our core, in our spirit. So that's what 2 Corinthians 10 is talking about. Let's keep reading. He says in verse 4, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, are not fleshy, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now, what are strongholds? Well, this word here speaks of something that is fortified, something that is being protected. And typically, because we don't like being wrong, we fortify our worldview. We fortify our beliefs about ourselves, about others, about God. And so whatever we have established in our minds, we tend to want to build up a support system that proves we were right. Are y'all with me here? And so that's what a stronghold is. It's looking in life for the evidence that proves I'm right. Sadly, it will ignore all the evidence that might make me change my mind. And so if I have a prejudice in my heart, I'm only looking for things that reinforce my prejudice. And I'm ignoring things that might remove that prejudice. And that's just one example of a stronghold. But it is a belief. It, 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 a word that you could study to really see what a biblical stronghold is, is confirmation bias. And in a quick summary, confirmation bias is people's tendency to process information by looking for or interpreting information that is consistent with their existing beliefs. And so once I believe something about you, I'm going to ignore anything that might make me give that another look or to give that person another chance. No, I'm only looking for the boulders 
are the bricks that help me build my fortress. And so I'm going to hold on to this experience or this thought, and I'm going to protect my mind, and I'm not going to, I'm looking for another one because I've got to build a fortress of my thought process, and I don't want you changing my mind. So I'm going to take all my life experiences, and I'm going to build up a stronghold that won't let you touch my mind. And to get to me, you've got to come through this. Oh, y'all hear what I'm saying, do you? Strongholds, it's not just a thought, it's a protected thought. It's an area of our belief that we don't want anybody touching. And so we build up strongholds to protect it so that we don't have to change. But there are some things that we need to change our minds about. Can you say amen? So now notice what this war looks like in verse 5, and then I want to go to Ephesians 6. He says, casting down imaginations. Now, Man was made in the image of God. We were made in the image of God. And being that God made man in his image, God uses imagery to create. And if, you're, if we're really honest with ourselves, whatever images we develop, we go through life trying to satisfy rectify or fulfill whatever our image is. So when we get an image in our heart or in our mind's eye, we want that image fulfilled. That's why social media can be so dangerous. That's, my, that's why what you read and what you look at and what videos you watch can be dangerous because the mind is never satisfied with just the image of the thing. The mind wants the satisfaction of the fulfillment of the thing. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? So I have to be able to recognize that imagery is off. That imagery is not healthy. This thought, this, this image I've developed in my mind, when it goes against truth, when it goes against the word of God, some images need to come down. I need to cast these thoughts down. And so often we build images of ourselves in insecurity that we are failures and that we will never be nothing and that we don't amount to anything and that we have no purpose and that we are unloved. And when you have that image and somebody comes along and they say, I love you, we say, oh no, 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 nobody loves me. Nobody loves me. And you built a wall that won't allow somebody to penetrate. And you think about how parents weren't there or how someone did you when you were in, in, in elementary school and you've built this wall of protection where you don't want those feelings being touched and you've built this idea of who you are and you don't want nobody to change it. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying to you? We can do that toward people. If we didn't have strongholds, we wouldn't have to deal with racism. Are you hear what I'm saying to you? I didn't mean to make you mad. I love you guys. Come back now. Watch this, biblical, biblical strongholds, biblical, you know, uh, 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 recognizing that, okay, th this word, this word, I need, a, I need a word to give me the right uh, uh, thought life, the right images in my life, casting down, verse 5, imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. I can't go through my mind and realize what thoughts are acceptable and which ones need to be rejected if I don't have a standard of truth. And that's where God's word comes in. It becomes my strength. It becomes my stronghold, if you will. It becomes the thing that I weigh all my thoughts up against. And notice he says, bring every thought, every thought. Underline those words there, circle them in verse five, imaginations and thought. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. I want to get my thought life right. I want to get my thought life right. Now, with that in mind, go with me to Ephesians. Just turn forward a few pages. I want to go to Ephesians chapter number six. Ephesians chapter number six. And we're going to start here in verse number 11. Ephesians six. So we're talking about the mind. And we dealt with this earlier in the series, Paying Attention. And this series is really pulling together the previous three that we've been talking about. But I wanna show you here in Ephesians 6 exactly how this works and, and winning this battle of the mind and recognize the power of a changed mind. Amen. Ephesians 6, you're there, say amen. We'll begin in verse number 11. 
Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now that word wiles, W-I-L-E-S, is translated strategies. Strategies. What does that mean? That means evil and the evil of this world and the author of evil is strategic. Spiritual warfare is real and the enemy of God and the enemy of his kingdom is real and he is strategic. One of my the, the favorite series, one of my favorite series that the Lord's ever graced me to minister was a series I did years ago called The Unseen War. The Unseen War. It may be on YouTube, you can pull it up. But there were three volumes, and one of the volumes was called Kings and Pawns. Kings and Pawns. And in and, 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 and Kings and Pawns, we realized I can live my life advancing the kingdom of God and be free. Or I can just live my life being the pawn of an enemy of the enemy. And I don't want to live my life the pawn of the enemy. So I've got to recognize that he is strategic. And some things that are going on in my life are not coincidental. Have you ever looked at your life and just begin to look at all the things that were happening on different fronts and be like, what in the world is going on? I'll tell you what's going on. It's the, the, the battle is real and spiritual warfare is real. And there is true opposition in this world, but I've got to recognize what opposition is. If you break the word opposition down into two parts, it just means opposed, op, opposed position. There is a position that God has for you and me. There's a position that God has for our lives and for our future and for our family and our faith and our finances. There's a purpose that God has for us. And the enemy is opposed to you and I fulfilling that purpose because when we fulfill our purpose, God is glorified. And everybody I'm talking to today has a purpose. And Jesus didn't just come and die for our sins to give us forgiveness. 2 Timothy 1.9 says he came to give us salvation and he came to give us a purpose. There's a purpose that God has for my life. And the enemy doesn't want you fulfilling it because when you do, that will bring God the most glory. When you do what God has called you to do. When you fulfill why you were born and the purpose for which you were here. And so opposition, that opposed position is reality. And God is saying here, put on my armor. Get armed. You've got to recognize you're in a battle. This is a war. And the enemy is strategic. And verse 12 says, we wrestle not. Our conflict is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities powers against the rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so he's saying, you're engaged in a battle over your soul. Not just your soul as far as salvation, your soul as far as control, your soul as far as your ability to make the right decision. There's this battle going on against our minds our minds are the control panel of our life. If you were driving this week and, and, and a blue car cut you off, it wasn't the blue car that would cut you off. It was the driver of the blue car that cut you off. And we got to recognize that in my life, I don't just do stuff. My mind has to choose to do it. The devil didn't make me do it. He might have tempted me, but I did it. You didn't make me do it. You might have gave me a reason to do it, but you didn't make me do it. I have control over my own life. Hallelujah. And so this, this, this war that we face is within. Now notice what God says to do in the middle of this conflict, this war. Verse 17. He says, take the helmet of salvation and take the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. And notice I'm to take this helmet and I'm to take this sword into my prayer life, verse 18. And 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says, pray without ceasing. So let's put together what we've just read. He says, you need the armor so that you can stand against the wiles of the devil, that you can stand against the strategy of the enemy that I, could, that I can win in life. Now, the enemy is strategic, and I don't want to always glorify him. I don't want to ever glorify him, but we're bad about talking about the enemy's busy and the devil did this and this and that. 
Man, we got to change our conversation. And we got to begin to magnify the Lord and quit making enemies so big all the time. Right? I done read in the word in Isaiah 54, 17 that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And, and, and notice he said no weapon formed. That means the enemy is strategic. And he will form specific, form specific weapons against you or me. But God has said it doesn't matter what he forms. It doesn't matter what it is he comes up with. He goes on to say, I created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire to heat up his furnace so he can put the metal in and form the weapon. God said, I knew what he was going to do before he heated the furnace. And I'm here to tell you that it doesn't matter what it is that he's working on, it won't work. So why do we get so caught up in what the enemy is doing when God has already said he might form the weapon, but it won't work? Amen? And the way that he's telling me to overcome these strategies of the enemy is that I've got to put on my helmet of salvation because I'm in a fight and I've got to grab my sword of the spirit which is the word of God which is an offensive weapon and I want to focus on those two pieces to this uniform right now putting on my, my helmet of salvation and grabbing the sword of the spirit because I'm in a fight now with that in mind let's turn over to the book of James and I want to go to chapter 1 James chapter 1 now, I told the previous service that I was going to use David as an example of all this. But what happened was, is I ran out of time. And I had to squeeze David in in the last millisecond of the message. And I can't let that happen again. So this time, I'm going to put David on the front end of this thing. So while you go to James chapter 1, let me tell you about David. Because David shows us how to do this very thing we're about to see here in James chapter 1. He shows us how to win the battle of the mind and how to put on the helmet of salvation to protect our minds from the warfare that we face at midnight and 3 a.m. in the morning when we wake up and our mind's just busy with all this stuff that we can't even do nothing about. This stuff that happened in my family or this stuff that happened on the job. I can't even pick up my phone and talk to nobody about it right now. And I'm stuck laying in my bed with all this warfare going on and I can't even do nothing about it. Mm, I'm taking this it. I'm taking this hit. We got to learn how to fight. Are oh, you hearing him saying to you? Driving down the road and just facing all this warfare. We've got to learn how to win the battle of the mind and how to put on the helmet of salvation. Amen. Now, let me read this one verse and I'm going to tell you a little bit about David. But watch this in James chapter 1. I want to show you this one verse here real quick. And then I'm going to give you David as an example. And then we're going to break down uh, a little more in chapter 1 here of James. But notice in verse 8. That a double-minded man is unstable. Now, you might be reading that saying... No, it says in all his ways. Well, if he's unstable in all his ways, he's unstable. So let's go ahead and read verse 8 out loud. Shreveport and Bozier, ready? Read. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So with my mind, anything with more than one head is a monster. Anything with more than one head is a monster. And yet we become monsters. Because we have double-mindedness going on. And, and the double-mindedness of indecisiveness. I'm thinking this way. And now I'm thinking that way. And now I'm back over here. And now I'm back over there. And I can't make a decision. And we need to make a decision. Because decision opens the door to reality. And you have no reality because you've not made a decision. And my flesh and temptations pulling me this way. But the conviction of God's spirit and truth and wise counsel is pulling me this way. And on good days, I'm going this way. But on bad days, I'm going that way. Am I talking to anybody? This is me, man. I'm not above none of this. This ain't some battle you won 13 years ago that you can tell folk, well, you know, about 13 years ago, I had a battle just like that thing right there, won it for Jesus. 
No, this is a battle you'll get about every 13 minutes in your life if you are not careful. This is an ongoing war that, that, that we never really totally win because we're always contending with this stuff. Are you hear what I'm saying to you? A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man. What if I have made my mind up about some things that need to change? And it, what, 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 what if my mind has built up this stronghold to protect a belief system or a thought that actually needs to change in my life? And until that thing changes in my life, my life won't change. Because even after salvation and, and knowing the Lord and having your name written in heaven, your life will never change until your mind changes. My life will never change until my mind changes. And there are things about our family and our faith and our future that will never change until our mind changes. And as long as the enemy can lock us up behind our own strongholds that won't let us change, our lives will never change. Strongholds. Fears, anxieties, insecurities, offenses, sin, lust that hold me captive, that tell me you'll never change. You're just like your daddy and your Uncle John. What do I do when my mind is telling me one thing, but his word has told me something else? Oh, what you say? What do I do when my mind is filled with fear and I know he called me to live by faith? What do I do when all I can think about is insecurity and I'm so uncertain of my future and even today, but yet I know he says in his word, my steps are ordered. How do I win this war? How do I get past this battle that I'm facing inside? Because I'm smiling at you, but I'm crying on the inside. I look like I got it all together, but I'm a wreck inside here. I had to spend extra time in front of the natural mirror today to make sure my hair and my wardrobe gave the portrait of a person that's got it together, but if you'd seen me an hour early, you'd know that I'm a wreck, and what you're really looking at is just a facade of hiding the real battle that I got going on in here. I'm uncertain about my future. I'm uncertain about my children. I'm uncertain about my job. I'm uncertain about whether or not I'm supposed to be living in Shreveport or Cushada. I've I, I got so much going on. I, hey! But I can't see it because you put on the facade that, that, that says everything is right and in the light. But I've got this war that's got me up at 3 in the morning. I've got this war that is plaguing within. And, and in reality, I'm double-minded and don't know what to do. I need the helmet of salvation. The uniform that God gave us in Ephesians 6 is spiritual. It's a metaphor to show us something. There's not a literal uniform that you can go down to the Christian store and buy this stuff and put on. It's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Paul has given us a metaphor that a person wouldn't go out to the field without having their uniform on. You can't go out to life without having your uniform on. And I feel like sometimes we step out into life, but we're not equipped for it. We're not ready for what we're going to face on the job. We're not ready for what we're going to face when we get home. We're not ready for why? Because we haven't put on the uniform. All of us have dealt with double-mindedness. But here's what David did. Now stay in James 1, but you, can put, but you can write in your notes Psalm 103, beginning in verse 1. Here's what David says in Psalm 103, verse 1. Whew. He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Now, it's easy to read that or hear that and, 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 and miss the weight of what he just said. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. The word bless is a spiritual endowment. It's power. It's power. It, 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 when, when the Lord has blessed you, he has endowed you. We miss it so many times because we get a new suit and say, ain't this a blessing? We get a new car and say, ain't that a blessing? We move in the new house and say, ain't that a blessing? And sadly, we've made blessing stuff. 
The blessing can bring stuff into your life, but stuff is not the blessing. Proverbs 10, 22 says, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich. In other words, it can make things happen in my life, but the thing it makes happen is not the blessing. The blessing, what was on my life that made that happen. The blessing of God is an anointing. It is an endowment. It's power. Ephesians 1 and 3 says that when Christ died and got up, he gave us every single spirit spiritual blessing see will, will he eat right and exercise thank you darling because we want our body to be able to carry out what our mind wills are y'all with me But do we invest in our mind? And I'm not talking about academia. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about something beyond education. Because knowledge alone won't help you. Wisdom is what we need. Because knowledge is one thing, but wisdom is another. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. If you don't know how to use your knowledge, it won't help you. So the blessing is an endowment. It's power. David said in Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul. What was he saying? He was saying, you need to magnify and empower the Lord. Not that I give him power, it's that I give him power. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. It's like Abraham when he came to the, uh, 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 Melchizedek in Genesis 14. And, 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 and Melchizedek spoke over Abraham. And he said, you, you've been blessed of the Most High. And then Abraham looked back and said, blessed be the Most High. Oh, what you say. If, if he bless me, I bless him. Bless the Lord. Honor extol, magnify, praise, make him big. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. I need that when my mind tells me I'm going to get put out. When my mind tells me I'll never graduate. When my mind tells me I'll never break this addiction in my life. When my mind tells me I I'm never going to be anything. Bless the Lord. I need to magnify the Lord in my mind. Make my mind a platform for his performance. Because Ephesians 3.20 says he will do exceedingly abundantly above all that I could ask or think. I got to get my mouth right, but I can't get my mouth right until I get my mind right. Because Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, that out of my mind, out of the abundance of my mind, would my mouth speak. So you could be saying the alphabet in your mind. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But once you start counting out loud to 10, the singing the alphabet stopped. A, B, C, D, one, two, three, C. I can't sing the alphabet and count to 10 at the same time. That right there will be enough to make you free. Because now I know I don't have to just sit around and let the enemy fill my mind with anything. I, 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 if, I'm, if, I'm, if the enemy's in my mind, my mouth must be silent. I got to open my mouth up so I can take back control of my mind. My mind can't think one thing and say another. I don't know what David was thinking when he said, oh, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. But it must have been something that was negative. It must have been something that was fearful. It must have been something that would have led him into bondage and brokenness. And he needed something bigger than what was in his mind. That will enable him, as we discovered in part one, to look at the giant who mocked him and said, what? You come at me like I'm a dog with your stick. But David said, wait a minute, boy. Wait a minute, big boy, that is. <laughs> the, 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 the lion that came again. Against me lost in the name of the Lord. The, the, the bear that came against me lost in the name of the Lord. And you shall be as one of them. David's mouth overrode the situation. He caused his mouth to line up with the word of faith in his mind. But we just sit around that devil just playing all kinds of thoughts. Woo. 
Because we ain't got to verse 2 yet. Hey, he actually only says bless the Lord three times in the whole Psalm 103. One, bless the Lord on my soul. Number two, bless the Lord on my soul. And then in verse 20, he says, bless the Lord. Uh, bless the Lord, ye his angels. But let me get to verse two. Because this is how you put on your helmet. When we accepted Christ, when we became born again, when we entered the family of God, there was a blessing we inherited. And to sum that inheritance up into one word, it'd be salvation. We make salvation born again, but we don't realize the born again gets salvation. And we really need to understand salvation because we name Jesus, but we don't know what the name means. The name Jesus is an English transliterated name that comes from the original Hebrew name Yahshua, which is in the Old Testament, Joshua, except it'd be a Yah because there's no J in Hebrew. Yah means Yahweh and Shua means saves. So Yahshua means God saves or God's salvation. Just his name means salvation. Which means if you don't have but a millisecond to pray, you better utter the name. There's, there's more power in that name, that one name, than anything you could ever fathom. Acts 4 says there's no name that God has given among men that would bring salvation like the name of Jesus. I don't need no other name but that name. Because he is the fulfillment of all the other names. Rapha, Nisi, Shalom, Shama, Sidkanu, Gamola. You say, what are you talking? Hebrew, names that were given to God that represented something that he had done when he brought about a victory. Nisi, when he brought about healing. Rapha, when he brought about a reward. Gamola, when he brought his presence. Shama, when he brought peace. Uh, Shalom. Are y'all hearing me? Jesus is all those names. You ain't got to study Hebrew. You ain't got to know all them names. When you say Jesus, you have said God saves. That's why we got to put his name everywhere. We can put his name. You never know if somebody ain't driving down the loop and see that name on that board and say, Jesus, there is power in that name. It, it means salvation. And we're, we're supposed to be putting on the helmet of salvation. So salvation is a Greek word that, 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 that means soteria. It, I'm sorry, it's the Greek word soteria. Here's what it means. It represents every spiritual, mental, and physical deliverance that's available. So David started declaring it in Psalm 103, verse 2. He says this, I'm quoting. He says, bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits. He's telling his mind, you got to remember. He's telling his mind, you got to remember. The word remember means to take all the stuff that's in line on your mind. To take all the stuff that's in line on your mind. Remember means pull that thing from wherever it is in that line and pull it up to the front of the line. That's what the word remember means. That's why you can be heading home and remember your wife asked you to stop by and get milk. And all of a sudden you screech and go to a U-turn. Why? You just remembered you're not to come home with Without no milk and happy wife is happy life so you pull it in the bushes remember means I'm taking that thing that had gotten pushed to the back and I'm bringing it to the front because whatever's at the front is in control oh my god You ain't got to get the list of everything in your life right. All you got to get is number one right. Get back. Give me get back down here. Ah, no, I'm doing this. When God said in his word, thou shalt have no other gods before me, it wasn't that he's some jealous God that says, oh, I'm so broken that you made me number three. No, there ain't but one God. 
So he doesn't have any insecurity in who he is. It's that he knows if he's not number one in your life, then number two, three, four, and five are not under his control. When I make him number one, I put him in complete control of everything else in my life. When he's number one, everything else has to surrender to whatever number one is. My children, in which I have four, five, if you count Jacoby, can say, we want to eat Italian. We want some burgers. We want some pizza. But all it would take is for my wife to say, All of them know. Number one just took control. Is, is it, I don't know if I'm making no sense up in here. Am I making any kind of sense? I ain't preaching this for me. I'm trying to help somebody here. All I need is to make him number one. So remember means you bring him to the forefront. So David, I don't know what he's facing, but this is what he said in Psalm 103 too. He said, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Don't forget his benefits. And then he listed them. So Jesus said, I think it's John 15, 23. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit has come, He's going to bring all things I've said to your remembrance. So the Holy Spirit in me wants me to remember what he said. Ooh, I got help if I listen. The Holy Spirit will bring to my remembrance everything Jesus said, but he can't remind me of what I never heard. I got to hear it so I can remember it. Baby, how'd you forget the milk? Because you never asked me for it. Yes, I did on a text. Let me show you right here. Oh, I forgot to send it to you. See, baby, I couldn't remember what you didn't give me. <laughs> but once you gave it to me, it's my responsibility to remember it. That's why I need the word. But the beauty of God's word is that it's so one with the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit in me will remind me of something I heard three years, seven months, and eight days ago. That, that, that should have been out of my intellect, but the Holy Spirit brought it back up because in this moment I needed it. That's why when you come to church, you pay attention because you might not need it today, but you might need it three months from now. You don't know what the eternal God might be trying to put in your spirit right now that the Holy Ghost can bring it back. Oh, my goodness. So David said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name and forget not all his benefits. Then he listed them in Psalm 103, verse 2. He began to list them. He said, number one, he forgives all my iniquities. See, I need to be reminded of that. I need to be reminded that he'll forgive me. 1 John 1, 9 says, that if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. I need to be reminded he forgives. Number two, he said he heals all my disease. I need to remember that. He said he'll satisfy my mouth with good things. I need to remember that. He said he'll execute righteousness on my behalf when I'm oppressed. That means he'll vindicate me. I need to remember that. He said he renew my youth like that of the eagle. I need to remember that. So David started just spitting them out, spitting them out. The things that God said he would do. He's declaring his salvation. What is he doing? He's putting his helmet on. And he's grabbing his sword. The helmet of salvation, I remember the name of Jesus. I remember the power of prayer. Oh, enemy, you thought you had me, but I'm praying tonight. Back in the day when you did this to me, I didn't know the Lord. I didn't know I could pray. I didn't know I could call on his name. But now I know I'm not who I used to be. Am I what I want to be? No. But I'm not who I used to be. Now I've been given a name. Now I've been given a promise. Now his spirit lives.
lives in me, and I know who I am in him, and so I'm going to put my helmet on. I'm going to put my helmet on. I'm going to put my salvation on. I'm going to put my forgiveness on. I'm going to put my redemption on. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. I'm going to put my word on. I'm going to put what he said on. I'm going to put it on, glory to God, so I can overcome what the enemy is trying to do. Isn't that good? All right, let's wrap up James 1 here. Watch this. Man, I'm sweating and spitting on my Baptist blue suit. All right, watch this. Verse 8, a double-minded man is unstable. See, that's why the enemy doesn't want you to make your mind up. All that indecisiveness. Make a decision. All right, let's drop way down to verse 21. 20, no, 19, 20, 21. Let's go to 21. We'll go to 21. Here we go. Wherefore, wherefore. See that word, wherefore? It's just like therefore. Therefore reason. It pulls together everything that was said before it. Wherefore, lay, up, lay apart. All filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Get the flesh out the way. And receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Now, not just my soul in that I'm redeemed, my name's written in heaven, I have eternal life. Save my soul before I see heaven. I need my soul saved right now when my mind's not right. The word saves my soul, not just past back in 19 whatever. No, the Lord's the word's saving my soul right now. Right? See, he said there are things you gotta lay aside and be meek about the word that'll save you. Watch this. The conviction to make a decision based on God's word is uh, to take on the offense, to, 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 to go ahead and, and, and claim my future today. The Bible teaches in Hebrews 12 that Esau, for a bowl of soup, it might have been gumbo. <laughs> it might have been stew. But it was obviously good. He came home one day so hungry that Jacob said, would you like a bowl of this? And Esau said, I would love a bowl of that. Jacob says, then give me your birthright. I want your blessing on my life, and I'll give you this bowl of food. I don't know what was going on in Esau's mind in that moment, but he sold out his future for a present reward that might not have lasted 10 minutes. Stay with me. The temptation to eat was so strong at that moment in Esau's life that he traded out his future for that temporary satisfaction. Now, let's don't act like we can't relate. So later in Genesis 27, Jacob comes walking. I'm sorry, uh, uh, his daddy comes walking in. And he says, Father. And he began to weep and cry hysterically out of control. And he says, will you bless me? Did you not leave any blessing for me? And, 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 and his dad is like, no, I gave it to Jacob. And he's like, but even his name tells you he's a deceiver. He tricked me. It's his fault. Give me a blessing. Did you save anything for me? Here's my point. He didn't cry until he saw what he had lost. And even when he's crying over what he lost, he's only crying over what he's lost, and he's blaming Jacob for his decision. 
And I don't know about you, but I'm tired of believers making decisions based on the flesh. We're trading our future for a bowl of soup, for a temporary thrill, for a temporary moment. We trade it, and we're not even feeling bad about it until way on down the line when we look at, oh, look what this costs me. I'd rather make a decision. I ain't saying I've done all this all the time. But I'd rather make a decision in that moment of conviction of truth that would protect my future and not cost me my future for the temptation of my present. Well, what if in that moment, in that double-mindedness, he could have steered toward the spirit. He could have steered toward faith. We would be knowing him, or we would be reading this as Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Esau. But instead we read it, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? Because Esau sold out his blessing to Jacob for a bowl of stew. When you study Hebrews 12... He wished his mind would have changed sooner. Have you ever lived through anything and you wish you had changed your mind sooner? Well, then go ahead and take advantage of that moment right now. Don't wait till later when something's cost you. And you're, you're, you're mourning over what it costs you. God's so good that his word and his spirit will put a, a word on you and a conviction on you that you got to make right now. You, you, you got to discipline your flesh. You got to say, no, I can change, but I won't change if I keep protecting these bad decisions. I'll never change as long as I keep blaming other people. I'll never change as long as I keep blaming Jacob. I'll never change as long as I keep eating soup when God's got something better. I'll I'll never change as long as I stay in this stronghold. Mm -mm. So let me finish this verse and we're going to pray. He said, be meek, receive the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. But be ye doers of the word. And not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, but he doesn't do the word, he's like a man that looks in a mirror, and, and that's what he said, that word glass means mirror. He looks in a mirror, verse 24, and, be, and beholds himself, he sees himself in the mirror, and then he goes his way and straightway forgot what manner of man he is. Did anybody look in the mirror before they left the house this morning? Who looked more than once? All right. <laughs> Hadn't that much changed? Some so free and looking no mirror at all. Hey, God, I'm sorry. Baby, let it go. <laughs> I got a point. I'm almost done. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, that's the word of God. So here, we're reading something that's also recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, that the Word of God is a spiritual mirror. Oh, my goodness. I don't know who I am that God made me to be until I look in a spiritual mirror. I know what I look like, but I don't know what... I am. Wow. I could go a whole lot further, but I know y'all get anxious, start leaving all that. <laughs> Jacob deceived to get his blessing. And he started walking and blessing, but he'd been crafty to get it. And so then later, one night, he finds out Esau's coming to see him with 400 men. 
And his mind started thinking, man, I done been tricking that boy his whole life. And he's coming to get me and got 400 men. They bet you they're soldiers. See, his mind went to work. Because he knew what he was walking in, he didn't really have outside of his own trickery. You got to stay with me. I know you're tempted to leave me out of the parking lot. Stay with me. Don't turn the channel yet. So that night, anxious about seeing Esau the next day, it's kind of like your chickens are coming home to roost. Y'all with me? And that night, God appeared through the form of a man, an angel. And Jacob grabbed hold of him, talking to God. And he said, I won't let you go until you bless me. But Jacob, you were already blessed. He needed to know that what he had came from God and not his own stuff. Because if this comes from God and not me, Esau can't take it tomorrow. So God looks at Jacob and he says, what is your name? He's trying to get Jacob to see who he is in himself. And Jacob means deceiver. He said, no more will your name be called Jacob. To get you to receive what I got and walk in what I got, I'm changing your name to Israel. And Israel, in, in a nutshell, means conflict or struggle or battle because that's what Jacob was doing with God was wrestling so he could be blessed so he could walk in the secured blessing of God God said no more Jacob now your name will be called Israel and I need you to recognize just how real this battle is but this battle is not between you and me this battle is between you and you So I live this life and I look in my natural mirror and if I, if I didn't need it, I got folk telling me that I'm ugly. I got folk telling me I ain't at the right weight. I got folk telling me, hey! <laughs> Instagram's telling me when I scroll the feed and I don't look like that. Y'all hard on me. TikTok is telling you that, young people. Old people too, sadly. And it's speaking insecurity. And it's speaking not enough and failure. And God is saying, would you please stop being double-minded? Why are you looking at that on Saturday night and then trying to come to me on Sunday morning? I need you to stop being so double-minded. I need you to come to grips with who I have made you to be. So I want you to look into this mirror. It's a spiritual mirror. And I want you to see who I made you to be. Then you'll stop the insecurity. Then you will stop the fear. Then you'll recognize who I have called you to be and the destiny. And one once you see what I have for you, you will stop selling out your future for your present. You'll overcome the double-mindedness. So write this verse in your notes. It's 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18. Here's what it says. It says, now the, now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with open face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. That whole chapter is teaching that when I look into his sacred word, when I look into the container of his glory, when I see who Jesus is, by looking at him, it's a spiritual mirror of who he made me to be. When God first made man, he made man in his own image. He's not changed his mind. He wants you and I to walk in the image of him, walk in the image of Jesus. But I cannot walk in the image of Jesus when that's not the mirror that I'm using to examine myself by.
I know you're down. Bless the Lord on my soul. I know you think you can't do it, but I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. That's a battle. But whatever stronghold that, that's been built in my life that's preventing me from walking in the image who God called me to be, I got to go. I had enough of this. I'm going to be who God called me to be, and I'm going to let him have my mind. I'm going to let him do something and heal the emotion of my life and the, 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 the thoughts of my life. I'm not just going to rest in insecurity and in fear and in turmoil and live in anxiety and worried about things that are outside of my control. That might have been me yesterday, but it is not me today. I've been double-minded all my life, but I'm getting ready to make a decision because there is power in a changed mind, and I'm going to make a decision that is based on truth and based Based on his love and his word. If you if, if we would just give him things we've been protecting, we'll see change. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, you know our strongholds. You know our strongholds. Thoughts, ideologies, worldviews, beliefs about you, about ourselves and others that we seek to protect. With every head bowed, can you just find that thought that you've been trying to protect? You can be so victimized that you become the victim and then you look for victimization. You expect not to get the job. You expect not to get chosen. And when you don't get picked, you let everybody know it. See there, see there, see there. I didn't get picked. See there, see there, see there. But God is saying, no, I chose you before the foundation of the world. What do you mean you didn't get picked? This will work for your good if you let me. Father, in the name of Jesus, may every stronghold that's protecting our view of you, ourselves, and others that's wrong, may these strongholds fall in the name of Jesus. What strongholds do you have? What lies have you believed? Where are you double-minded? If you convince yourself that you're not lovable, you'll never receive love. But you are lovable. And you are strong. And you are beautiful in God's eyes and whatever we've stained ourselves with his blood will remove Isaiah said though our sin be like scarlet he'll clean it brighter than snow and that word scarlet refers to a dye that came out of insects that would stain clothing permanently what has stained you? What has stained you in your past? Was it something your mom or dad did? Was it something that happened when you were in school? Was it that divorce? Was it when you didn't finish school? What stained you? Were you in an abusive relationship? And you were told again and again that you were worthless until you begin to believe it. What stains you? And are you protecting those stains? Because I'm here to tell you that Jesus is ready to remove whatever stains you. Who told you these lies?
let's make a decision today. I'm going to stop protecting negative thoughts. I'm going to stop protecting my fear and my anxiety and my bitterness. I'm going to stop protecting it. I don't want to build these strongholds any bigger than what they already are. Because it's time they fall. You don't have anything to prove. Oh, glory. You don't have anything to prove. Quit trying to prove yourself. Quit trying to go on that job and to prove yourself. What do you have to prove? Do what you've been called to do. Stay in your own lane. You don't have nothing to prove. It don't matter what other folk think about you. It only matters what you think about you and what God has said about you. Walk in the liberty of that and quit being held in bondage to other people. I'm going to pray a prayer of faith and I'm going to invite you to pray along with me you don't have to this is no mantra that's been written I'm just going to pray from my heart I'm praying for me and I invite you to join in Heavenly Father I believe you made man in your own image. You made me to be an image bearer of who you are. And I acknowledge through my own sin bad decisions I've not represented your love and your truth and your will and I acknowledge I'm stained my strongholds the walls that I put up to protect my thoughts my past and the way I see others and the way I see you And even the way I see myself. I ask you to give me a conviction of truth. That will change my mind. in the areas that need change in the way I see myself the way I see others and how I see you and I believe you love me and you sent Jesus to die for my stain die for my sins and I believe you raised him from the dead that I could have eternal life and a relationship with you and by your Holy Spirit I can look into your word and see who you made me to be and I could live a life that will bring you glory I'll see your freedom 
as you tear down the walls I built. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. What a morning. Glory to God. Amen. Well, listen, let's stand together. We've got altar ministers on both campuses down front. If you need prayer, just come forward. Let one of these men or women of faith pray with you. Otherwise, you can be dismissed. We have midweek Bible study in worship and word on Wednesday, 630. Hope that you'll be here. I love you. Have a blessed week.